Come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits? The Saturday Night Freak Show. (laughs) Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie podcast, the fastest growing in the world, as far as we know. It comes at you every way, every week, every Saturday night. Whether you're ready for it or not, we hope you do us a favor and go on over to wherever you found us. Hit that like or subscribe button. Uh, All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you in our quest for total universe domination. These are the Internet Radio Superstars. Holly. Sean. Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by... Michaela. Uh, Michaela, what do we watch tonight? Well, we're on our summer blockbuster failure adventure. We, we, you. <laughs> I'm driving the bus. You guys are along for the tour. Uh, our last stop was uh, Serenity last month from 2019. The second stop is 2010's Jonah Hex. Where do we get Hex. off on this? <laughs> the, uh, How many fall. Stops are there? This quarantine is probably going to last forever. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so who was? Uh, so this is from the year 2010. Who directed this? Uh, a guy named Kenny Hayward. You ever heard of him before? He has four directing credits total. <laughs> Best known other than this for Horton Hears a Who, the animated movie. Oh wow! Well, there you go. <laughs> so, was that a, was that after this? No, it was before this. Oh, okay. That gate okay. that got him the job. They're like Jonah Hex. Hey, have you seen Horton Years Who? It's great. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's but I don't know how much directing goes into an animated movie, you know? I don't know. Um okay, so uh well this um he wasn't supposed to be the original director on this, right? This was a this was a production hell kind of situation. This movie went through numerous rewrites, people quitting, people getting fired. Um, people you. having to redo their work over and over again. It's it. No one wanted to be involved. I don't know if you guys could tell from the performances that everyone really got tired of being here. But this was a not a fun movie set to be on. What performances? <laughs> who was? Uh, well, I heard the um, the guys who did Crank and Gamer, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You mentioned that, Colin. So yes, this movie was written by Neville Dean and Taylor. Which I did not realize until this week when I was researching for the show. I had seen this movie before, but I had no idea they wrote it. Um, they were originally supposed to direct it, and then they had a falling out with DC because DC was stepping in a lot, and Warner Brothers was stepping in a lot, a lot of studio control. But knowing that they wrote it, it makes so much more sense. If you've seen Crank or Crank High Voltage, Gamer, Gamer is that's a fucking wild movie. Stay mm. tuned for Gamer. We'll watch that eventually. <laughs> this feels like Crank sometimes. They also did Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance, the sequel. Feels a lot like that. <laughs> uh, and then they had their breakup like three or four years ago where they don't work together anymore. And um, Brian Taylor went and did Mom and Dad and Mark Neville Dean did the Vatican tapes. Oh, wow. So, so they should probably get back together. Yeah. Okay, so that's, wow. Well, you said DC. What are you talking about? For those who don't know what you're talking about. This is a DC Comics character. What? Yeah, a long-running one. I'm a big Jonah Hex fan, so I was, like, I was excited for this movie until I saw the trailer, and then I was like, oh, no, that's not at all what I want. I went and saw it anyways. (laughs) What, uh, I mean, did you read the comics? Yeah. Like, what, um... I mean, he didn't go all the way back because what he came around in the seventies, right? I believe so. Jonah Hex. Um, I would just buy like compendiums when I worked at the bookstore and read them. Okay, did you read the uh, the Joe R. Lansdale stuff that he did? I think so. That was uh, Two Gun Absolutely. Mojo, and um, what was the other one called? He did three, I think, <laughs> in the nineties. Um, Riders of the Worm and such. And mm-hmm. Shadow Hawk, Shadow West. Sorry, that's the other one. Joe Lansdale, he's an author. He uh, writes all these kind of like weird uh, westerny pulp tales out of uh, Texas, usually. But we'd probably know he's the guy who wrote uh, Bubba Hotep. He ca- created the characters Hap and Leonard. They just had their TV show on Sundance a couple of years ago. Uh, he's that's that guy. Show. Oh, and he made uh, a movie that I keep uh, recommending every single. He wrote. 
the the book that a movie that I would recommend all the time. It's called Cold in July, um, with oh, Dexter yeah. Dexter in it. Yeah, I really like that movie. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. But he did so. I mean, Hex had been around since like 1971, right? He came out and mm-hmm. uh, it was all star western, I think. And then, they, but he w- didn't have his own series, I think, until '77, if I remember correctly. That sounds right. And then, uh, but he's not a supernatural character in the comic books. No, that's that's like a big departure this movie makes. Is like just like a brief background in Jonah Hex. He was a Confederate soldier that was like tortured and ki- and like almost killed basically. And then uh and his whole family is killed. And so he just becomes a badass bounty hunter that has like a code of ethics. So he's basically like Western Punisher, Western Batman, but he has like almost supernatural level marksmanship. Like he's the best marksman. No one can outshoot him. He's the best gunsmith. But that's like where his abilities end. <laughs> Whereas this movie takes it like a whole step further, and yeah, that was the exact moment clothes. I checked out. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. See, that's the thing where I just whenever oh, you this, is, this you, is Old West Crow too. I just realized <laughs> that. <laughs> well, he's got his spirit animal, right? He comes back from the dead. He's um, okay. Well, well, I mean, well, I guess we'll talk about all this stuff, but. Uh, is it like, I mean, this is just kind of a weird idea, right? That you're going to take a comic book character that's um, well-regarded, maybe not very well-known, but he's just a Western character, a Western outlaw. He's an anti-hero, right? such a simple right? concept. Yeah, yeah, right? It's like, so you want to make a movie, you spend like, I don't know, a million bucks and you go shoot in Spain or you make some cheap like spaghetti Western kind of thing, right? How hard is that to fuck up? <laughs> oh, this movie's so overwrought and so convoluted and it was pretty easy. Needlessly so. Well, I mean, like there there well, there the is the biggest issue that, that contributed to its uh I mean, just in we're talking about just the character here, not right? Not even about the marketability of making a, a big special effects western in twenty ten. But just, you know, if you're looking at the an adaptation of the character, uh why do you have to go? Cause I guess maybe the Joe Lansdale stuff, right? When he did it, um, two gun mojo does have zombies, right? So there are zombies in that story. It kind of makes these kind of, it takes Jonah Hex into like weird tales territory and kind of hor- Western horror, which is like, Oh, okay. That sounds like a yeah, cool he idea. Does, like he does like encounter supernatural stuff sometimes. And he does cross over with like other DC characters and stuff, but like his yeah exactly what you're saying like he does kind of like any any comic book does that you know where they have like this weird intersection with like horror or supernatural or something but this movie like you gotta set up a world first before you start throwing stuff like that in oh they did in that uh 45 <laughs> second intro to the movie everything was set up the cold <laughs> open that was a whole movie itself it's the whole movie I watched them. I'm just like, why? This is what are we? So what are we gonna do now? That was the movie. <laughs> well, explain this to us. What are you talking? What's the cold open? This is pre-title. Oh, this is the the story that we get. This is the comic book cold open where they animate it. This feels like it's a motion um, comic. It oh, really oh, is. that. And, but yeah. this feels like an after the fact thing that they put in the movie. I don't know if it was, but it really feels like we need to explain this because we don't have enough in this movie that does. So I put money on it. Yeah, I put money on it too. Uh, we get a whole motion comic that explains how he became, quote unquote, Jonah Hex. Um, and I want to say his name, Jonah Hex, at least 20 more times during this podcast, uh, like they do in the movie. Yeah. Um, but apparently, so they go through his whole story, um, his, uh, which we go through like three or four more times during the movie, about how his family was killed. Uh, he wanted to get revenge. Uh, he was brought back to life by the Crow Indians. Um, he's got some supernatural powers. He could talk to the dead. <sighs> a few other things. In now that really he talk to the dead. He, if he touches them, he can bring them back to life for a few minutes to talk to them, which right. is ex- like taken. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know the timelines for this, but that BBC series Torchwood, that was a spinoff of Dr. Who. The whole premise of that show is it's a detective department that has the technology to bring people back from the dead and solve like how they were killed. Mm. That's the whole premise of that show. And they kind of just like took that and shoved it into Jonah Hex where it didn't belong. Yeah, there's some Isn't of that, that like in the Hellboy. Of pushing daisies as well. Yeah, and I True Calling. So. You remember True Calling and with oh, Eliza, yeah, with Eliza Dushku. Dushku? Yeah. 
But it's kind of like, it seems like it comes from like, uh, well, the only reason I say Hellboy, because I think Hellboy was like the year prior to this, right? Wasn't that 2009? Maybe I I'm wrong. I believe so. Um, so there's a big interest at this time in comic book characters. The Marvel superhero universe hasn't really kicked off yet. I mean, that's what we think of now when we think of, you know, big comic book movies. But this is that period where they were still cranking them out all the fucking time. They just weren't interconnected. And so studios were looking for... Uh, what's another comic book property that we can somehow exploit, make into a big budget uh, movie. And most of these, you know, obviously the DC has, uh, is owned by Warner brothers and then you get legendary pictures in there. They're the people who you know produced uh, the Batman movies. Yeah. I think Watchmen, wasn't that one of those two? Um, yeah. But they do like these yeah, just, huge expensive movies. <clears throat> yeah. Just for some perspective, the green lantern movie was the year after this. So that's the period we're in. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they all feel like they belong in like 2004, like yeah. Punisher, Daredevil, like these movies feel like they're part of that. Yeah, well, this one certainly does. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Oh God, Michaela, Michaela, did you just foreshadow one of your future blockbuster picks? I don't think I can watch Green Lantern again. I really okay. don't. I, <laughs> right, that good. movie feels like it's like three hours long. You know? It, yeah. It does. I, I don't. Th- I really don't think I can sit through that movie again. Good. Good. Well, this one has a pretty good cast. Uh, I mean, by good, I don't know if they're necessarily cast well for the roles, but they it has a lot of above the line talent. Who are some of the people who are in this? Well, who plays Jonah Hex? Josh Brolin. And this would have been, uh, I mean, around the time that he was doing like W, right? Wasn't uh, True yeah. Grit? What year was True Grit? Was that right that around? Might here? have been right around here. 2010 2011 something like that um so i mean he was an established you know actor obviously he's been around since what the goonies or i mean yeah josh brolin yeah. son of james brolin you know has been doing stuff forever um and so this was i think uh i mean you know he's on like a, a streak here of leading man roles right and this Absolutely. is one of those, get yourself a, a comic book character that you can be the main character. I mean, later on, he'd go on to play, obviously, the big one is Thanos, right? In the Avengers yeah. uh, series. Cable and Deadpool. Yeah. I was going to say Deadpool, yeah. He's tried this several times. Mm-hmm. He was in Men in Black 3, don't forget that. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. And this was not his first Western, because when he was a kid, he was on a show called uh, The Young Riders. I think he played, uh, I think he was Wild Bill Hickok. Way back in the, what would that have been, like the early 90s or something like that? Yeah. Um, well, don't forget uh, No Country for Old Men. He's pretty much I was going to, I was hoping oh, that was, that was well before this. Yeah. I was just about to say, what year was that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also have the It Girl of the Moment. This is Megan Fox. Um, she, because uh, 07, right? Oh, was Transformers? 05? Yeah. Yeah. Transformers, I think, was 07 or 08, maybe. And that was the movie that, you know, the thing about Megan Fox is I can, I like, when I think of her, I'm like, how come she didn't have, I can only think of four characters that she's, I mean, it seems like she's been around for like 20 years. Generous term. Yeah. Well, she's Megan Fox in all of them. Here she tries a little bit of a Southern Belle kind of twang to her, but it's like, okay. But basically there's what Transformers, this Jennifer's body, and then uh, the plastic surgery version in the, the. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies, later day All Megan right. Fox, right? It's like beyond that, I mean, for a, an actress who's as well known as she is, it feels like her body of work, there should be more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but didn't she burn some bridges in Hollywood? Wasn't that like a thing around the, why well, she was kicked yeah, off she, the third Transformers movie? She called out Michael movie? Bay for being the creep that he is, and that was before Harvey Weinstein, so no one took it seriously. Yeah, yeah, so she got blacklisted from Hollywood as being difficult to work with or something like mm-hmm. that. I don't know. but uh, Or, I mean, I don't know. Uh, if they just judge her on the perfor- on her performance. She has, is it a charisma that she has? Or just like, she's just so. radiantly beautiful. I think maybe that's the thing that she has going for her. Because I don't know about her skills as an actress. I, I've never understood the fascination with her, honestly. I oh, think I think I liked her the most in Jennifer's body. Yeah, actually she yeah, of the four I mentioned, that's the one where she has the most 
to do as a, you know, her, as a skill as an actress, I think. To be fair, in this movie, th- there's nothing for her to do. You can completely no. cut the character out. This is a character yeah. called uh, Tallulah Honestly. Black, right? Who they completely changed her around, didn't they, for this, uh, for the movie? I mean, Tallulah Black is like that character's love interest in the comics, but she has her own, like, she's actually a character and has, like, things to do and dimension. I think she, like, even, like, loses an eye at one point and becomes more interesting. So, but in this, that character you can just take out of the story entirely. Yeah, she's a bounty hunter, I think, in the original. She's just a damsel in distress in this movie. That's all. Well, they go out of their way to prove that that's not the case because she's a prostitute who. But um, it's still the case. (laughs) It is up until the third act when yeah. everything is completely different. Yeah. yeah. Up until then, they make it out to be that she's extremely capable of herself. And uh, I don't know, it just seems like, uh, I don't know, uh, just um, an off-putting personality for like that job. <laughs> you know, it's like, isn't the right. whole idea to get guys to want to be with you? But whatever. Um, we've also got as the main bad guy, we've got um, John Malkovich. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what a, what a what a waste. He doesn't even have a good accent in this movie. He's not doing a good John Malkovich accent. He knows what movie he's in and he's like uh, I don't need to care. They should have <laughs> as he's a bad John Malkovich is a bad guy in a movie. They need to let him loose. What's the yeah, point of what, having John Malkovich? Watching his performance in this it felt like watching Donald Sutherland and Virus all over again. Mhm. Yeah. 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 He's just not having fun. The only one who's really like yeah. having fun is Fastbender. There was boat fights in this movie too. <laughs> back to back boat fights. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna have a western, you gotta end it on a boat, like you said. Yeah. Um, How else would you do it, Colin? Well, what, this movie takes place. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michael Fassbender's in this because this is that period where he was doing anything that anybody offered him. Right. He was just well, in he's every about goddamn to pop movie. Off, right. Because the next year is X Men: First Class and Shame. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it was yeah. was Inglorious Bastards the movie that put him like on the I like I'd never seen the guy before prior to that movie to be honest with you. Then it was I like he was like, in everything. Got Shame got him the indie cred. Yeah. And then X Men got him the uh, hey I can do this for the rest of my life playing Magneto and I got money in the bank. Yeah. yeah, a ton of supporting character actors appear for like a scene here and there. Um, we've got Aiden Quinn playing, uh, Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. He's president Grant at this point. What year is this then? 2010. No, the, um, Oh, the year of, uh, I don't know. It's not important. Colin. Well, it's sometime it's really between, I actually looked it up cause the, I always see these movies and the Washington monument is always being built. You know, it took 40 <laughs> years to make that thing. They started construction in 1848 and finished in 1888. So there you go. This is it's built in this and it's got scaffolding. So I'm going to say most westerns seem to take place around like 1885, and it's also mm-hmm. after the Civil War, right? So yeah, it's always it's always just after the Civil War, always right. Um, but who else is? Uh, we saw Wes Bentley shows up in it. Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Very yeah. Um, Could have used more of him. Will Lance, Arnett. Will Arnett's in this. Lance Reddick is in it. Uh, Michael Shannon is in it. Apparently, second, yeah. Well, I didn't second. even see him. Who? <laughs> who? I, 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 I was, I was like about the, to say I missed it. He was like the Barker just before the Snake Man battle. Oh, oh okay. With, oh, with Tom Wopat with, with the hat and everything. Yeah. How okay. Much I bet he had a way bigger role that just hit the cutting room floor. I'll bet he did. This thing feels like it was cut to shit. He was mm-hmm. prominently featured in the end credits, and according to MF Mad, the keeper of. The Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Uh, Michael Shannon has now made it to a place on the wall. That's right. He's been in three movies that we've covered. Do you know which ones? I don't. No. Well, he no. was Zod in uh, Man of Steel, our three and a half episode, uh, three and a half hour episode of Man of Steel. Uh, he was in Groundhog Day. Apparently, we watched Groundhog Day. Yes, we did. <laughs> and you might have been on sabbatical when that happened because at some point you went on a walkabout. Uh, I, I had to explore. I just had to walk the earth. You know <laughs> yep. who I ran into? Kane in the Kung Fu. No, I ran into what's his name? Um, uh, from Pulp Fiction. Uh, uh, Julius. Yeah, Julius. Julius. Yeah. Uh, so a that's, bad motherfucker. That's three for Michael Shannon. Um, nice. 
All right, so Jonah Hex is a, um, he's an, a Confederate soldier, right? Mm-hmm. Who has turned into a bounty hunter. And we're introduced to him in an opening sequence. Um, I don't know. Does it set up the tone of the movie? What would you think of this? I mean, I mean, like I've been watching a lot of Westerns, I guess that's the thing. So it's like, Ooh, Western, you know, that was kind of the, the thing that I went into when I first saw this in 2010, I was like, okay, this is going to be like a Western. And I knew like, okay, it's a comic book Western. So that means they're going to do something dumb, like wild, wild West or something. Sure enough, they do. But yeah, um, the, at the beginning, it really doesn't go that far. It's about when uh, the time when he uh, does uh, show off that he has magical powers and can touch people and bring them magically back to life so he can interrogate them. And then there's something else going on where you actually like uh, they start burning like vampires. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually really like the first act of this movie up until that power is revealed. Yeah. Because yeah. it is just like a Western yeah. up until that's then. What I, yeah, that's what I was going to... Okay, so set us up. Like, what's going on and who's the character and what's the uh, what's the plot going to be here? So Jonah Hex, like, in a very quick voiceover that delivers a whole movie's worth of story in, like, a, a minute uh, over a motion comic and in the cold open before that, too. Um, Jonah Hex is a Confederate soldier. Um, his commanding officer becomes kind of radicalized after the war, like a radicalized terrorist. And that's John Malkovich. And he's ordering Jonah Hex and his son, Jeb, who's play, who's Jeffrey Dean Morgan, um, to kind of like go commit all these terrorist acts. And um, Jonah Hex is kind of like, yeah, that's, I'm not cool with that. And then ends up killing Jeb in some sort of feud over if they should blow up a hospital or not. Um, so then Quentin Turnbull, John Malkovich's character, kills his whole family, burns his house down, and then brands him with a QT on his face is where he gets like the scarring on his face. And then crucifies him and leaves him for dead. That's when the natives come, take him down, bring him back to life. That's where he gets his paranormal ability. And up until the paranormal ability part, that is the exact same origin story as Bohannon on the Hell on Wheels TV show. <laughs> so I guess Hell on Wheels is probably a better adaptation of Jonah Hex than this actual movie. <laughs> Well, this is like, this is a, this is a, a uh, I mean, it, this is a pretty safe way to start it up. You're creating your badass motherfucker, right? Because basically his single reason for existing is to get revenge against that motherfucker who burned down his whole world, right? You know what another word for safe is, Colin? It's boring. <laughs> well, like, this is a good setup they just don't it, it's, it's classic it. we'll say right, classic it's, it's, we'll, we'll say classic it's the setup they should go like but the execution yeah i agree with the setup the execution is the problem i have but then in the the motion comic voiceover we find out that jonah hex went around searching for him became a bounty hunter lives by a code finds out john malkovich died in a fire of a hotel saloon um so now he's just like has all this pent up revenge and vengeance that he just can't exact on the guy so what's he, he's just becoming a bounty hunter. And like, then we come to like probably my favorite scene in the movie where like he pulls into a town, pulling three bodies behind a horse, turns in the bodies for the bounty, unveils his awesome Gatling guns on the side of his horse. <laughs> How do you think the horse the felt about that? <laughs> that horse would have had a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. If they actually like, did this, uh, that horse would have bolted and gone crazy. But yeah, he's got yes. twin Gatling guns. This, I mean, brings to mind. I mean, it's outlaw Josie Wales, a uh, little bit of Django. This is, I mean, these are that's classic, classic Western images, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're kind of going over the top, but it's like okay, you're you're not completely out of the bounds of where I'm going to go. Like okay. You have gone a place where I can't go at this point. You're still at this point. Well, then, then they do kind of, cause he, he throws a, I think a Molotov cocktail or something, he shoots a stick of dynamite into a, you know, as he's leaving this town and after he's killed everybody, they won't pay him the bounty or whatever. And it blows up like the whole town. And I'm like, okay, it's one of those movies where all of the old Western stores had like, were loaded with dynamite or something. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of blasting in the area. They're looking for golden caves. There's a lot of blasting. Did they say that? The- no, not at all. Going- okay. I'm, I'm going to assume it was like crammed full of like really potent liquor. Yeah, there you go. That's the best yeah. I can come up with. <laughs> Barrels but of it. I- I do love the line of, I know it's really stupid and it's really cheesy, but like, this is the only part of the movie that is like, 
kind of comfortable and enjoyable for me when he's like five caskets you should only eat eight and then he <laughs> unveils the gatling guns i kind of love that part i like when he shoots the guy back into the casket yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. that's fun yeah yeah it's not bad i mean you know it's it's kind of i was sitting there thinking um it's like the production design on this is like what you would hope for for this kind of Western. There's just something about the the shooting style maybe or something that renders yes. it kind of flat. It's very workmanlike. There's not – this is basically like when you shoot a movie, you put a camera here. Make sure you get a close-up right. here. Make sure you cut not away there. can be Deacons, Colin. Not yeah. every Western is going to have that golden, beautiful look to it. Well, that's the other thing that I thought because like soon after this, there's a scene where it turns out that Trumbull, the John Malkovich, it's Trumbull, right? Turnbull. Turnbull is still alive, and he and his gang uh, rob a train, and you know they put on the hoods, and they you know they're all like storming the train and all this. And I'm like, why isn't this scene taking place at night? You know, it would have yeah. added like an atmosphere to it or something. But they're oh, doing. But I hate the nighttime scenes in this movie because they're so obviously day for night. They look terrible. Yeah, there's a lot of computer generated uh, background. You can actually this is back in the era when you can see the the halo around the edge of a character that it's, separates yeah. them from the fake you know night sky and all that shit. That's what makes yep. it look so dated. I think. I think Sean, that's where a lot of like you were saying it looks like it's like 2003, 2004. Like, yeah, that's not helping at all. No, this movie does not look like it's only ten years old. I, I almost don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I think this sat on the shelf for six years. Yeah. Well, you know how like Venom kind of had that vibe of like a 2005 movie. Yeah. That's kind of how yeah. this is too. You know. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I mean, especially, well, I don't know, with just the the weird anachronisms of uh, you know, as the movie goes on, obviously it's going to put a lot of stuff uh, that seems out of place with the time period. I mean, including the score. The scores, a part of the score is by Mastodon. The, yeah, let's talk about the score. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this felt like a great Mastodon music video. <laughs> it, it It's butt rock everywhere. Like, it's either completely silent or it's like chugging guitars nonstop. Mm, butt rock. And, like, that sound, I think, dates it horribly. Wait, what else do we call butt rock? Because I've, I've heard uh, Nickelback uh, called butt I mean, rock. That's not. It sounds this is, like, like. Okay, the guys from Mastodon to... are no, like, Trent Reznor. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're not exactly well versed in writing scores oh, yeah they have no clue yeah so it, it just doesn't work i don't think you know yeah it's just masted on music like laid under some of the scenes of the movie quite a few of them and the I other guess. scenes are completely silent and then other scenes are scored by marco beltrami uh yeah. like coming in to rescue but he doesn't have any like decent themes or anything to work with and it's like no. okay well, um, and the, the guys from mastodon were saying that they like wrote their quote-unquote score and then the studio came back to them and said, so we ha we fired our first composer and now we're bringing in Marco Beltrami. So you need to work with him again and rewrite everything you wrote. And we have reshoots. Yeah. Then they're just like, OK, we, I put everything into the first time. Now I just want to get done. We've got other commitments. So although mm -hmm. I uh, from what I understand, the uh, what was it an EP they put out uh, actually charted when it came <laughs> out. It was like the new Mastodon, Jonah Hex, you know. <laughs> <laughs> EP, bam. I think there's like it's five a, tracks on it or something. I, I feel like this movie really suffers from because it doesn't have a good score. I think a good score really could have elevated it a lot. Yeah, and a better cinematographer. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of the Neville Dean and Taylor style of action movies. I know people love Crank, but... Well, it, it works in Crank. It doesn't work in this old Western, what should yeah. be a, a more of a Western feel to it. But Which I understand is, why they think a comic book western they can have those liberties, you know. Like, yeah, but they're the doing a lot Jonah of like isn't exactly like ours. But this is the thing that I always complain about in these type of movies, where it's like they don't have any kind of faith that you have any kind of patience at all. Which is something that you know when you watch the movies of uh, of Tarantino or Ari Aster or these guys, it's like. Clearly we do, because we go to see those movies where you can actually take time and let scenes actually play out. But these are, you know, the camera's always swooping in and pulling way back and flying around and all this to try and in, in, to give you the impression that something's ha exciting is happening because they don't want yeah, you to fall asleep. Yeah, trying to do that too. Yeah. Especially with, the, especially with the fight scenes and everything. It's just like, ah, I can't see anything that's going on. 
And see, but that's the thing, though. That's the problem I have with this movie is that it does pull me back in a little bit when, like, the big set pieces do happen. Not so much Again, the boat stuff, but the stuff before. They, they, have, they have good explosions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of stuff explodes. <laughs> they blow stuff, up, blow stuff up real good. Well, speaking of explosions, what is our bad guy's motivation? What's he after? What's the big, uh, what's the thing going on here? Well, it's a movie after 9-11, so terrorism. Yeah, I, I caught that too. Like they, you got guys who are strapped with dynamite, you know, and all this other stuff. I'm like, what the? He just wants to be a terrorist. He's that's a, pretty much all there is to it. Like, yeah, because his yeah, motivation. No, is- I was trying to pin it down. Uh, basically, he is against the the states uh, joining together after the Civil War. Right. Uh, sure. And- when did that? When was that established, Colin? Because I did not pick up on that. Well, this is the only thing because he was, you know, he said something. Who is he talking to? Either West Bentley or Fassbender about um, preventing these these, you know, quote unquote, great state United States of America or something like that. Yeah. But I get what you're saying. It's not well established. They don't really say like, well, is this like why? You know, other than he was a Confederate general and just doesn't, you know, he wants to go down with the South, apparently. Or something because yeah. he can't have his way and he's going to be a terrorist and he's going to blow up the uh the united states of course this is 1885 or whatever so how do you blow up the united states in 1885 uh you turn into dr arliss loveless and you have a giant mechanized spider made <laughs> which is it could have gone that direction this is basically this movie's version of that i mean he's like we need a big gun yeah, That's the weapon. Does. When they're always the talking weapon. about it, he's building the weapon, Grant says. It shoots what looks like the Dragon Balls from Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> okay. Much. Or, or the glowing uh, orange balls. Or the memories from Inside Out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even entirely sure how this works, but we're told that they were, they were, they were designed by Eli Whitney, the father of the cotton gin, who yeah. apparently, apparently got radicalized and became a terrorist. Well, no, he actually, uh, okay, according <laughs> to the movie. Why did like that? <laughs> well, he was, I mean, what they say in the movie, he's responsible for, like, uh, interchangeable parts and really upgrading weaponry at the time. Yeah, he made, his factory made a lot of muskets, I guess, in real yeah. life. But in this one, uh, in the movie, they say that basically he was tasked by the government to design, like, a super weapon. So basically, then, it's supposed to be, you know, he's designing the equivalent of the atom bomb or something in uh, 1885 and because of his conscience he didn't want to build it but uh turnbull knows where it is and he has to get like you know he has to kill one guy to get the key to whatever the thing is so you get the parts together and actually build the thing right and then he's he's gonna launch the yeah that was because he had to go find the location of the whatever with the combination whatever the key thing right there was a key not important i'm i'm so lost uh, I, yeah, I, movie. It I feel like, like six I, subplots. Yeah, I, I feel I like feel, we watched I, a different movie. I know. I feel like Jonah Hex walked into a room and then they had a big gun and that was yeah. it. Right. Oh. that's what we saw. Well, that that's was toward it, the right? end. He didn't actually have that until they tested it on the town. They they tested right. on a small town and blow it up. That was like forty five or maybe an hour into the movie. So I before that, that, he was trying to find it. Though. The what? I, I liked that villain moment for John Malkovich where he's just sitting on like the edge of a mountain drinking his fancy cocktail and watching them test this gun in this small town. He's, he's drinking absinthe. That is a good, that's yeah. a villain moment. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, drinking was, his absinthe and he's like, fire. At that point, I was like, you know what? Maybe I see his side. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're living like, like a king out there. It's kind of cool right now. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted more of that atmosphere in this movie. I'm sure it's on the cutting room floor. I think we wanted Wild Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> you say that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we saw that movie. With Wild Wild West. Well, this well, movie. I, it, honestly, I'd watch that as a drive in. This with Wild Wild West. I'd go yeah. for that. That'd be bad. What about this with Lone Ranger? No, I know. No, that movie's just boring. Well, that movie, again, could have been helped by. That one's over long. This one's too short. Yeah. That one's too long. But there is a good movie in Lone Ranger if somebody wants to cut down like the hour and, you know, 30 minute version. Um, it does feel like a diet 
Bruckheimer Verbinski movie, doesn't it? It really does. It just feels yeah. generic. It feels like every movie that came out around that time, you know? Well, I mean, we spent all this. So now we're talking about like what the bad guy is up to. So basically he wants to, during the, the, the 4th of July blow up, you know, uh, an America. Well, I guess the Capitol is what he's shooting for, right? He's going to blow up Washington, mm-hmm. DC. Mm-hmm. So what's Jonah Hex got to do with any of this? <laughs> I mean, he's got the supernatural power. So I guess use that to your advantage, even though that power is stupid and isn't really important in this movie. He still wants revenge, Colin. Yeah, I think that's it right there. He still that's wants it. revenge. So President Grant is like, get me Jonah Hex. Like uh, he's got he's the president of the United States and he's got a military. But I need this one guy, Jonah Hex. Why? Because Jonah Hex hates Turnbull. And once mm-hmm. he learns he's alive. And of course, Jonah Hex is doing the whole Snake Plissken thing where I don't give a fuck about your war or your president. But Turnbull's alive. Okay, well, I want Turnbull, right? So he gets recruited back into the service of the United States in order to go after and pursue this guy. So now he's got to follow clues to actually find out where Turnbull is so he can head him off at the pass and prevent the destruction of the United States. Question, is this really where we want to see a Western hero with the stakes of like, you've got to, this is like every comic book movie does this, right? The yep. stakes are the destruction of the world, and our hero exactly. <laughs> has to stop it from happening. <laughs> right. This is the problem I have with most comic book movies, is that the, the scope is always like the world is going to end, and it doesn't have to be that big. But there's no reason for a Western to ever go that big. No. Never. Like, it could, it, this movie should really just be him chasing down Turnbull for his own personal vengeance, and that's it. Yeah. Clint Eastwood did that and made a whole career out of that. Yeah, exactly. that's all. That's all you need to do. Simplicity. We're okay with that. Yeah, well, I was fine. He we would go a, see that movie. He could still have a scarred face and shit. Just you know, I yeah. mean, just I mean, hasn't Liam Neeson made a whole career out of that now too? Yeah, I mean, you can still have your shootouts on the train and you know your horse chases and stuff like that, but you don't actually have to have people launching like a whole crew of bad guys launching glowing energy balls off of a ship to try and <laughs> blow up a 4th of July celebration. <sighs> yeah, why don't why don't the balls just blow up on their own? Like I didn't get that. There's a lot of there's a lot of steps to this. Yeah, cuz they have to throw these three big metallic larger balls. You got to shoot those first, right? Into yeah. the center of the town and then you launch the energy one and then that somehow detonates it and it causes basically a thermonuclear explosion. Mm, yep. Yeah, this is just Makes what I okay. want. How does, uh, so Tallulah, how does she get involved in the adventure? She's kidnapped. <laughs> That's it. That's literally it. Find something he loves. Yeah. Bring it to me. Okay. So that, right. Okay. So, right. Because, uh, Turnbull's already killed, um, Hex's family and Hex is yeah. a man with no country. He says, he's just basically out there surviving. Right. So this is the thing you got to give the anti-hero Mad Max. He's, yeah. You got to give him something above himself to become a hero. Right. Yeah. Um, it could have just as well been Smith, his arms dealer for all this movie matters, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. the Lance Reddick character, right. Who kind of mm-hmm. gives him that scene that you have in every goddamn one of these movies where here's all one the scene. weapons that you can choose from. Um, but we're supposed to believe they have an established relationship, even though, we know nothing about this guy and have heard no mention of him. Yeah. Because I don't get like how Jonah Hex has any friends. Yeah. He seems like a drifter, right? Yeah. And he's an asshole to everybody that he meets. And he, you know, I mean, that's, he's, you know, does that whole thing that all tough guy, uh, movie characters do, which is, uh, anyone who gets close to me dies. So I'm actually protecting you by being an asshole. So you won't like want to hang around with me. That was the other thing that I was just like, I'm oh god, I'm tired of watching this. It's like everyone around me dies. <laughs> I can't be with you, even though I love you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Boy, well, so I don't understand how Michael Fassbender determined that uh, the prostitute Lila was uh, the the uh, person that Jonah Hex had a, a crush on. I don't know. I mean, the whole like state showed up to take him from her room, so. True. Maybe there's a connection there, but the, the but I'm doing homework for the movie. So. Yeah. 
Because you're saying there's yeah. about 40 minutes in between those scenes. It's, <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, Turnbull's like, go find me something he loves. And the next scene is you're Michael doing Fassbender. you accent than John Malkovich did. Oh, yeah? He's literally not trying. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like, anybody else get the, he looked kind of looked like the Predator with his bald head and then hair coming I off to the like side. I thought he looked like Gallagher, man. He, he looked like, he looked yeah, like who? Like Gallagher. Oh, Gallagher. He looked to me, it was uh, the closest I've seen is um, the um, Wild Bill Hickok on the Deadwood show, right? He has that long curly hair in the hat. And it's like, okay, are you doing that? Because when was Deadwood? That was the 90s right around then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, ultimately we get uh, the big fireworks. I mean, Jonah Hex has to go and resurrect uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, which is, um, that's Malkovich's son, right? Yeah. Correct. They were pals before um, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Jeb, went militaristic, right? or sorry, radicalized. Right. And then, um, you know, friend turned on friend, Jonah Hex had to shoot him. And so they have like this little heart to heart. And I'm not entirely sure what information he got out. He has to go to a creepy graveyard. And I'm like, all these scenes where he has to talk to the dead, right? If you read this in a script, I assume you're going to go like, Ooh, that could be, that could be interesting and really spooky. Right. And really like this, I think this scene has the most emotion of that. Like anybody shows in this movie, but even still, that's like barely nothing. But I can see why reading it on paper, this sounds like it could be really tense and dramatic and mm-hmm. emotional. Well, it doesn't work because he has to explain his entire relationship in the dialogue with the guy. Right. Like We don't know who the fuck this guy is. Uh, you know, I didn't remember that he was the guy. I know he's Jeb. That's the guy's son. Uh, but I don't know how, he, you know, Hex and him were really related in all that you know and then they had to basically lay out their entire relationship and dialogue right. before he kills him again <laughs> you know yeah he has to return him to the grave um yeah um i did like that shot of him lowering him down into the grave and then letting go where he turned back into the skeleton i i, I do like that yeah oh, well mm-hmm. i like the intention of it the cheesy effects maybe not right. but the intention right. of it i think is uh is interesting a lot of good intentions yeah yeah, this you whole know. movie. Uh, this whole movie, I was watching it, and I was like, "There is so much potential here. Like, there's so many things that should work, but don't." That's what makes it so frustrating, right? Like, yeah. it's a frustrating yeah. movie to watch because you know how you can fix it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd cast Barry Pepper as uh, Jonah Hex. What do you think? No one's ever said that. Okay. No one's ever said I'd cast <laughs> Barry Pepper. Period. There you go. I would cast Pepper's good. Barry Pepper. <laughs> mangle his face all up and says people who probably uh, haven't seen battlefield earth I saw battlefield like earth. bad guy from uh true grit though that's why yeah i think yeah maybe i'm like that maybe that's it maybe that's what i had in my head i'm like that guy is jonah hex to me but i actually yeah. think josh brolin's a great casting choice for jonah hex i just it's I obvious do. he doesn't care I think he's a good actor. I just don't know. Well, I don't know. It depends on what you're going after, I guess. Is he, he he's going after kind of that Clint Eastwood man with no name kind of, you know, vibe, right? So basically you're just going to growl a lot and look pissed off and surly. Yeah. I do like the gag when he's in the bar and he takes his shot and it comes out through his cheek. I do like that part. Yeah. Do we say he's got, yeah, there's we, more of that. he's got a mangled face. It's, it's not as severe as two face, but he does have that little um, piece of skin that hangs down over one lip. And he's, so he's got a hole where you can see his exposed teeth. It's a pretty decent um, and probably uncomfortable as all hell to wear makeup, you know, where, yeah. But, yeah Cause I imagine they had a wire in his mouth. The hole is like, his lip lack the yeah. entire time. When I was time. reading, they said that, so Josh Brolin, the, during the whole filming of this, could, o- could only shave half of his face because he has, you know, like the, the five o'clock shadow on the other side. Um, and it, so, like, he had to wear, like, half a beard, basically, for months. And he also couldn't eat or drink anything with the prosthetic in. So, like, you think about long days on the set and you can't eat or drink anything and get fucking hangry working on this movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was also wondering if they had to have, like, spit suction because just the way that it, it's done, you know, his mouth is always kind of hanging open. Although, I was actually thinking about that from the makeup effects standpoint, like, you know, envisioning some makeup effects guy, like, trying this on himself to see, like, how far he could go before it started to distort your your voice you know because they have to leave his lips intact enough 
that he can speak. I mean, unless it was all dubbed over later, but it didn't seem like it was. No. You know, so he's got to be still be able to enunciate his words, but also have part of his face all, you know, curled up or pulled back. It's not a bad makeup effect, but now we've seen Two-Face and we go like, well, that's probably more. Wasn't Jonah Hex in the comic like blind in one eye? Uh, I think that happens later on, yes. Okay. Uh, For some reason, I thought that, yeah, because when you were saying he had like a supernatural ability or what, preternatural uh, marksmanship and all that, I'm like, I think he only had one eye. I think that's what made it like a... But he never had the ability to bring the dead back to life. That is completely made up by this movie. Okay, so that wasn't even in the the Joan Lansdale things. Mm-mm. Yeah. Well, later DC fucked with that character, too, and they brought him into, like, the 21st century, and then he had to try and get back. I think there was a series called He Pets. fought Batman once. And uh, won. That's right. Joan Hex mm-hmm. is one of the guys who beat Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the comic is still running. I think so. Maybe. Uh, our DC was sued by, you know, um, Johnny and Edgar Winter. Oh yeah, free ride and Frankenstein, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, apparently, in the Joe Lansdale um, series, the Two Gun Mojo, he had a couple of characters named Johnny and Edgar, and they sued. It took eight years. They sued for defamation for representation, Damn. and they lost. Yeah. Oh, they lost. Well, good. Uh, I mean, come on, Johnny and Edgar, Old West. Come on. Yeah, they were not flattered by their appearance uh. in Jonah Hex. At the That's end funny. of the movie, okay, so here's another uh, area where the, the movie kind of uh, is on a slippery creative s- slope. Um, he finally, Jonah Hex finally does have a showdown with his arch nemesis on the deck of this boat. He's got two showdowns. Explain what you mean. When Jonah Hex is like, he's near death, and they say this in voiceover, when you're near death, something something happens with the rest of your life or anything. He, he imagines having a fight with uh, Turnbull. Um, and so, like, he rises out of a red sand grave, and him and Turnbull have a fist fight, and it goes on forever. But they're having that simultaneously, because this is a vision that Hex is having. He has it simultaneously while he's fighting um, Turnbull on the boat as well. Except the action is different. So it's, it's like, it's very than... confusing to fucking watch. Yeah. Yes. Because you're like, in one, he's shooting him. And, What's that? And it's unexceptional, too. What'd you say, Holly? I said this was my least favorite part of the movie. Of everything that is wrong with this movie, I hated this the most. Yeah. As soon as they get on the boat, I'm like, ugh, I'm out. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I took this scene to mean that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is basically the red tinted red sand place with the red skies where they're fighting uh, around the coffin. This is their souls fighting, right? Because Jonah Hex is half in the spirit world. So it's their spirits, basically. Well, he so- says, they say when you die, you have a vision of like exacting all your vengeance or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's your unfinished what business. That is. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Even though he wasn't dying at that point. Well, but he has he was, that vision. He was when it started. Though. Yeah, he was when the vision started an yeah. hour earlier. Yeah, and when he finished, got shot and he finished the, the vision. Yeah, when he finished the vision at the end of the movie. Yeah, he blows uh, in the vision. He kills Turnbull by shooting him multiple times with a revolver. But in real life, uh, he actually like crushes him inside the uh, whatever the mechanism that's gonna. Yeah. Shouldn't they have this taken his head off? This movie would have been uh, uh, better with, like, rated R. Especially, like, when Fassbender gets killed, he gets his head put in a, in a fan blade. Yeah. I mean, that could have been cool. Because so they, they do potential. show the result of that, though, and it's like, well, what happened to him? Nothing. He's just dead. I'm like, yeah. the guy, he put his head in a giant, like, ship fan blade. Yeah, his head should be split in half. Yeah, there's nothing. Maybe there's a little pool of blood behind his head. I couldn't even see it because the picture was so dim. Yeah, there should have it. been blood splattering all over Jonah Hex's face in that yeah. scene. Yeah, it oh, seems like if you're going to do that question. kind of thing, you got to commit. You know, it's like, just go, because, mm-hmm. I mean, you're already talking about a character that, I mean, forgive me, comic fans, I think is probably unknown to a great many uh, non-comic readers. B-team. So you mm-hmm. could, uh, <laughs> is this a B-team? We might even be, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so 
you, I think you could take a risk at that point. Cause like, what are you trying to attract a crowd of kids? I will <laughs> say in all yeah. fairness to this movie, the Marvel machine didn't exist. Like superhero movies were not what they are right now. So we're looking back on this with the hindsight of, you know, what 20 some Marvel movies and Deadpool, a successful R rated comic book movie, you know, that this was like it, for lack of a better analogy, it was like the Wild West of like figuring this shit out back then. I think you probably could have done yeah. it without like making yeah. any kind of comic book tie ins at all and just like adapt, you know, just had a straight, you know, Western. Yeah, because at this point, we already had Iron Man, we already had The Dark Knight. Like, we did have good comic book movies. But those are right, superhero like movies. They weren't rated that committed well, to serious violence or anything. Well, we we did. It was just like six years earlier, made by a different company. Like this was the Fox version of this stuff. I'm looking yeah. at you, Punisher, which is where it seems yeah. like they're drawing a lot of inspiration. Even that, that was rated R. And Even it was Blade was rated R, R and that was late 90s and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, you could do it. I mean, especially because I think, you know, Blade... People saw that movie because it was a cool movie about a vampire hunter. And then you found out yeah. it was like, oh, and it's based on a Marvel character. I think you could have applied the same thing here instead of going like, this is a DC Comics character. And he's also a Western dude. And, you know, and you're like, hey, huh, what? I'd I would argue that DC is in the same place right now, though. They still don't know what to do with any of their fucking characters. That's true. They haven't learned a damn thing in 10 years. They are killing it in the uh, direct to video animated stuff on their DC Universe channel or whatever, yeah, where you can find different. motion comic episodes of Jonah Hex. He lives. Uh, he lives there apparently. He should probably stay. There. Yeah. Well, all right. Jonah Hex. At the end of the movie, he does save the day. And. And then he rides off the one liner. And he's offered a job as sheriff of the United States. <laughs> right. The United States needs a sheriff. I saw so great. many. This is, I love that he acknowledged how stupid it was, though. Yeah. These are like sure. the things where I was seeing the parallels with Escape from New York, which I don't know, you know, because at the end, obviously, like, you know, he gets offered, come work for us. There's a scene in a pit fighting establishment. Uh, right. There's the guy, you know, the guy who was his friend who betrayed him, who's there. But. That's because Snake Plissken, and, and the only reason I'm saying I'm gravitating this is because basically Brolin is playing Snake Plissken without the eye patch, right? Um, right. But even Snake Plissken, then, is that's all based on Western archetypes and mythology. So you're kind of right. coming full mm -hmm. circle again. But yeah, at the end, it's like, come work for us, Snake or Jonah or whoever. I'm like, no, I'm going to go off and do my own thing because, you know. Yeah. And then he is riding off with Tallulah, right? They're now going off on adventures in the sequel, Joan Hex nope. 2. He does not ride off with her. He rides off with a dog. Rides oh, off that's with right. The, dog. the mangy dog. This is also to give us some kind of like, well, people don't like him, but the animals do. His horse is loyal and the, the scarred up dog, he takes a fun. He did save that dog. Yeah. That's right. I won't save yeah. people, but he save the dog. I don't know. He does save people, just worthy people. He he doesn't seem like they didn't commit with that character. It feels like it's like either you got to be more of a hardcore motherfucker and just unlikable, and it's like force of nature, or you actually have to kind of go like, well, I live by this code, and this violates the code, and you know. But he doesn't. Even just sum up this money, but I mean, this whole movie by saying they didn't commit. <laughs> well, they <laughs> committed right there. They committed how there much is. to making That's it? The podcast. <laughs> what was the budget on this? Oh, you! It's guys. This is really depressing. It was forty-seven million dollars. Forty-seven million. How much did it make? Ten million. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it opened at number seven. Yikes! Well, I remember five million. It's opening weekend. The ad campaign, if I remember, had this nice shiny font that like didn't look Western at all. Uh, all of the uh, ad campaign and all that made it look like this really slick thing where stuff explodes and there's witty one-liners and whatever. And it was just like, it doesn't look like they're, a Western. They're there, but yeah. not that frequent. So it's like, is it supposed to be a superhero thing? Because I guess it was marketed like it was a superhero thing. Like somebody in the marketing department said, what, it's a comic book character? This is the, what the template for what the ad looks like. And it's like, no, it's a Western, but whatever. <laughs> I do like the one liner it ends with just because I've heard it a million times in a million other movies. And so I knew it was coming the whole, like they say 
uh, a man with vengeance in his heart has to dig two graves, one for his enemy, one for himself. It's like, I've heard that in everything. Yeah. yeah it's like ancient. Is that the art of war? The old, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. mine stays empty. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know he's looking at, he's looking at a horrible afterlife. So like Constantine, which is another movie that this kind of yeah. felt like at some point, it's like, once you die, John, they're all waiting for you on the other side. Cause you've fucked so many people up in life. I think that's actually something like what Jeb says to Jonah in the movie. Basically, yes. Yeah. They're waiting for you down here. I got plans for you. Well, all right. Any final words on Jonah Hex before we... No. Okay. Well, we're going to go around the table. We're going to tell you whether or not you should watch Jonah Hex. Some of us, this was the first time seeing it tonight. Am I right? True. true, true. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you'll get fresh perspectives. But first of all, we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our helpful mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. He rode up on his little pony express horse. <laughs> To deliver the mail. A horse that's just named horse. It's a yeah. mini horse named horse. And the horse is all falling horse. apart. Mini you know, horse. Barely any skin on it. I was going to say, I was going to say it's one of those like old school toys, with, like the stick with the horse head on it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's even yes. better. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's like so slimy. That is exactly it. <laughs> well, we want to let you know how you can join in the mailbag and join the Freak Show family. Uh, all you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or maybe Twitter's your thing. We're on Twitter. You can follow along on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. If you like to email, we got you covered. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Do you like to email? Is that a, is that a thing? Can you have that kink? <laughs> Liking to email? If you I do, like if somebody no. does, Sean. <laughs> Sean, if it exists, there's a kink of it. Yep. True. If you do, let us know. Oh, God, I love that font. <laughs> and uh, oh, you can send, also send, send. You can also follow along on Instagram. We're everywhere. I mean, we're everywhere you are. I mean, that's basically what we're coming down to. So uh, that's Instagram. It's uh, at Freak Show, right? Saturday Night Freak Show on Instagram. About Jonah Hex, MF Mad, Keeper of the Wall. Writes in and says, I remember sort of liking this because it came out a month after Red Dead Redemption and it felt more like the game than the comics. I can see that for sure. I, I, that's probably where I'm going to be playing now. I'm in the mood now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go watch uh, uh, Bone Tomahawk when we're done here. Yeah, there nice. you go. Yeah, that's like one of the best modern westerns right there, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Whitaker writes in and says, well, it just goes to show you that if it's not Batman or Superman, Warner brothers doesn't put that much inf effort into their comic book movies. They actually have a fairly extensive line of Western comics, and I would love to see them make a Western movie cinematic universe. I'd be down for that. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. Name but yeah. They just care about competing with Marvel. I was going to say, can you name one other DC Western Comic there was a series called Just a Pilgrim that I read for a while. That's right. a terrible title. Yeah, it's bad, but it was a good series. There was like there was like zombies and stuff in that one too. Well, I actually looked it up. I mean, there's a character called Scalp Hunter, which I think replaced Jonah Hex in uh, the original run. But Johnny Thunder, Nighthawk, not the one you're thinking of, Tomahawk, and the Trigger Twins were some of the DC Westerns. That's what they, who they have in their stable. Western I'd watch characters. a cinematic universe of that. That'd be all right. And Tallulah Black, because I think she also mm -hmm. had like her own. I'm not sure if she was always a supporting character. She got her own. Uh, she's. Mm -hmm. I've seen modern looking drawings of her, so I know they're still doing that. Brent Zemecki writes in and says, Jonah Hex is not a very good movie, but it was nice to see them take a chance on one of my favorite obscure DC characters. And Brolin was a good fit. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yep. Uh, That's what makes it so frustrating. <laughs> Homicide yeah. McLeod writes in and says, I love this flick. In fact, I'm watching it right now. We had a pretty good uh, timing with our tweet or whatever there this morning. I, I, I like, I feel like I've never even met someone else that's even seen it. So I'm shocked to, to <laughs> hear that someone loves it. There you go. 
Uh, about uh, two weeks ago, we watched a movie called Spookies. Brett Williams wrote in and said, uh, I liked the rewatch episode so much. I replayed the episode for a second listen through right afterwards. I enjoyed finally getting Holly and Michaela's opinion and the new information from the vinegar syndrome release was a good reason to revisit. He says, chief justice, John Jay, this is uh, the house where they filmed spookies, right? If you go back and listen to our spookies episode, but chief justice, John Jay was the founding father assigned to me for my early American history class term paper. I wish I knew then. And could have added spookies <laughs> to my citations. I'm sure it would have amused my professor. <laughs> That'd be good. Yes, I want that spookies and scholarly papers all the time now. Right? Oh yeah, that's amazing. So that's I'm, why you, I, I'm vindicated. You, that's why you say, listen Sean to the punching the air in victory right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm saying that's I why you listen to the person. Saturday Night Freak Show because we will teach you stuff that you can use on term papers. Boom. Yes. We're educational. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Stuart we'll D. Something today. Stuart Dees writes in and says, I discovered you guys about a year ago, and I've tried to listen to every episode since then. My favorite by far is The Boy. Wait, Sean, what's the name of that movie? The Boy. Uh, He says, simply because you guys read a comment of mine and actually pronounced my last name properly. People People always ask if it's pronounced Diaz, and I say no. It's pronounced D's, as in D's nuts. He's nuts. It says, I died laughing hearing you joking, jokingly point that out, so now you have a fan for life. Thanks for all you do. Sincerely, Stuart D's nuts. Yeah, that's, that's that, is, that is now your call sign. D's nuts. D's nuts. <laughs> well, th- thank you I all for writing in. <laughs> Keep I mean, we, can, so we can, we can call you it. Michaela D's nuts if you'd like. <laughs> I have no problem doing that. I'll make that my like Skype ID. Right. There you go. So when you get a call, it's from Michaela D's nuts. <laughs> Sorry, everybody quiet. I have a call from Michaela D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. I tell you, now you've uh, waited this long. So we're going to give you what you've been waiting for. The most exciting part of the night so far. We're going to go around the virtual table and we're going to tell you what we thought of tonight's movie. Jonah. Hex. Oh, shit. I was wondering who you were going to go with tonight, but there you go. You got it. That is in the lineup. Well, I was just going to pick myself because I want to go first. But were you going to yell your own name? I was, and then I was just going to start talking. You uh, should Colin, have. I mean, I really should have. All right, screw it. Sean. Sean, what did you think? I'm Jonah Hex tonight. Well, I'll tell you, Sean, what I thought about Jonah Hex. Um, what an inconsequential movie. Uh, uh, yeah. Ugh. yeah. I'm just going to make noises at this movie. That's how I feel about it. Um, I was, it's that old story, uh, you know, they killed his family. Now he wants revenge. I mean, it can be done well and it can be interesting and God knows we've watched plenty of those movies. Um, but boy, was I not feeling this movie tonight? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, I mean, just knowing that there is, I remember the stories about being, there being production, major production problems on this movie. Um, uh, I don't really remember being that interested in it when it saw like the trailers, when it was first coming out. Um, I mean, I guess that kind of explains why I never watched it in the 10 years it's been out. Um, but boy, there's really nothing for me to grab onto in this movie that would give me any enjoyment whatsoever. Uh, I'm sure, um, Brolin was uh, Brolin's probably the best option to cast in this character, but man, it's like, they don't give him enough to do with it or anything cool to do with it or even good dialogue to do with it. Um, it's pretty, well, I mean, I was kind of just bored and there wasn't really much to keep me in with this. Um, when they start going to the big weapons and stuff, I'm just like, I, I would rather be watching wild, wild west right now. Uh, I never thought I'd say that. Um, but I would rather watch that movie over this one. Um, wow. That, that's what you did to me, Jonah hex. Um, but at least while the West had Salma Hayek. Um, yeah, I can't, uh, I cannot, uh, give this a pass. Um, or I cannot recommend this whatsoever. Um, uh, do not watch Jonah Hex. Um, there are plenty of other better Westerns out there, you know, to get your jollies from. So I'm definitely going to pass on Jonah Hex. Uh, and now you can go Colin. No, thank you, Sean. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, when it started, because, I mean, I remember 
not thinking highly of the movie the first time that I watched it, whatever, you know, 10 years ago. Um, tonight, I'm like, okay, you know, you sit down, you turn it on, and you're like, eh, this isn't as bad as I remember it being. It's like, it's not good, but it's not offensive, you know. Uh, and then, you know, there's that goofy thing where he's talking to the dead guy, and I thought, yeah, they really missed an opportunity. It's like, could have been spooky, but it's just kind of flat, bad visual effects that so you're like, okay. And then uh, the more that they brought in, the as the film goes on, it gets goofier and goofier. Like, not intentionally goofier, just like in a way that I'm like, I don't care about any of this. I don't care about the villain's plot to destroy the world. There's like no personal stakes in it. Um, Jonah Hex is, you know, kind of the cut from the cloth, um, you know, stoic, uh, rage fueled loner type who, uh, you know, will rescue the damsel and get the bad guy in the end. It's like, okay, well, there's really no, not a whole lot of conflict there. Uh, and he can't do anything there's nothing cool about him you know other than he has a scarred looking face that wears off after about five minutes you're like okay well he's got a distinctive look to his face but you know he doesn't really seem to possess any i don't know anything really no special talent i mean you know he's supposed to be this great marksman he's a survivalist and all this none of this is really a hit in a way that separates him from a bunch of other kind of cardboard generic movie heroes um Malkovich is having a good time. I like the fact that there were a bunch of, you know, faces that showed up during the movie, uh, the, you know, familiar faces, but overall it was just kind of, by the time it got to the end, yeah, it was a snoozer. It's a snoozer at 81 minutes. And we're saying that like at least five of that is, uh, credits at, at the end and probably at the beginning too. So, I mean, you really have like a borderline feature length film here. So it just kind of, it moves really quick. So I guess that's one of the things about it. You're not going to be putting in a whole lot of time if you do decide to watch it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't recommend it. And I have been watching a lot of Westerns in that 10-year period. I went down a Western rabbit hole. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you can see the callbacks and stuff like, oh, that was done in The Wild Bunch. And that was done in, you know, a Clint Eastwood movie. Um, it just kind of, it's a movie that lacks its own distinct personality. I suppose maybe that's it. It feels generic. So, yeah, I think you can watch um, anything else. I mean, it's not hard to sit through, but it's just like, you know, why waste the time? So uh, after me would be Holly. What would you think of Jonah Hex? Colin, I I really thought you were going to say, I I watched this two weeks ago, so I wasn't that that keen on watching it again. (laughs) No, I gave it its fair shot, whatever. In, uh, upon release so this was a good to revisit and confirm you know where i was on it so yeah mm-hmm. holly what'd you think oh First yeah i know i think you i think you hit the nail on the head um this it's a concept that we have seen done before and we've seen it done better um so there's no new groundbreaking territory here and like like you said it's not offensively bad you know it's it's not an I don't want to say it's not an awful movie, but I mean, I, I guess it's not. It's just, it's boring. There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing, like you said, there's nothing to relate to. Um, I'm not attached to any of these characters. I'm not impressed by the story. Um, I did like that it was short. I agree with you there. Um, there's just, there's so much potential of it. It could have been cool. I Like the supernatural aspect, I think could have been really awesome. Um, that I think that was the most disappointing part to me. Like, obviously just the fact that nothing was truly original, nothing was really anything memorable is disappointing, but I think they could have done something really cool with the supernatural aspect, especially if it wasn't part of the comics. If that was something that they added later, like if you're going to add it, then make it cool, you know, then really bring it. Um, so that was disappointing to me. Um, yeah, this is not a memorable movie. Um, I can, I can understand why no one really saw it and there was definitely no buzz about it. Um, you know, I, I don't think that Josh Brolin was a bad choice. I think he's he's a good he's a good uh, a choice to play that character. I don't really think anyone was a bad choice. I wonder if a lot of it was because of the direction. I wonder. I mean, a lot of it was also because of the writing. The writing was just not good. Um, but yeah, I love John Malkovich, and even if he even if they could have done more with the character, I still love him, and I don't think he can do anything wrong. Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone was necessarily a bad choice. I think it was just the movie in general just doesn't work 
you know, sometimes you take all the components that seem like they would go together and they just don't. I don't know. There's a lot of like, why didn't it work questions with this movie? And obviously we, I think we, you know, hit a lot of them in our discussion, but yeah, it just not memorable. doesn't hit the mark and you could, you could definitely pass on Jonah Hex. Michaela, you brought it. What did you think? Um, well, I'm curious what our time is at. I'm curious if our episode's going to run longer than the runtime of this movie. But <laughs> Five more minutes. <laughs> well, one thing I I can't believe I forgot to mention this earlier, but you guys kept talking about the Punisher and how it felt like Punisher in the Old West. Yeah. So Thomas Jane actually is really obsessed with Jonah Hex. He and make wanted a good to play Jonah Hex so bad that yeah. he hired a makeup artist to do him up in the makeup and the costume and did like a photo shoot and sent it to WB and the director being like, hire me. And they're they're like, no, dude. Oh, that's kind Wait, of is sad. this online? Isn't it? It up. That is sad. <laughs> yeah. I want to see these photos though. He tends to do that a lot. He made a Punisher short video after he was the Punisher because they wanted to make he wanted to do more Punisher stuff. Yeah. And so he, he made an off-brand Punisher short film. That's it doesn't seem pretty good. Him. It, no, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> no. It comes off as needy and desperate, I think. Right? Give this man some work. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is hard because I want to love this movie, but it doesn't love me back. And it doesn't <laughs> want to love me. And that hurts, you know? Like, <laughs> it's Jonah Hex is not a character that's going to get a lot of shots at a movie like this. And it sucks that they fucking squandered the chance. Oh, Ooh. Colin's showing us a picture of. Oh, Tom's yeah, I remember being. seeing these. It, oh. It's a little too pretty, I think. Yeah, he's not. He, well, he's got like the dead eye, but he's not all. Well, I mean, whatever. He doesn't look like grizzled enough, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. He still looks like pretty Thomas Jane, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brolin's doing it good. He's got that. Um, he's got that Clint Eastwood scowl. That there. rugged kind of yeah. It's yeah. Uh, oh, they could have done so much. They should have done more eye work in this movie. Yeah. 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 Just, they kind of just did the mouth part, and that was kind of where they stopped with the makeup. But yeah. um. Oh, the yeah, eye would have been cool. I love the comic books. I love the comic book character. And so like when I heard they were making this and I heard they cast Josh Brolin, I was like, this is perfect. Like, and because like comic book movies weren't really like in a template or a machine the way they are now, I was like, you know, my imagination was kind of running wild with what it could be. And it, it, yeah, it did. I w- as soon as they introduced the supernatural stuff in the theater, I remember being like, that's not part of this at all. What are you doing? Oh, no. And that was like the exact moment. Like, I was like, this, there's no turning back for this movie. Um, and I really came out of it hating it then and just being like offended by it as someone who loved Jonah Hex. This time I was a m- much kinder to it, I think. Sorry, Hallie. What were you going to say? I have, a qu- I have a question. Was mm-hmm. there anyone else in your theater? Um. I don't think so because I feel like something else big came out the same weekend. Mm. I feel like there was another big movie everyone else was going to see. If I remember correctly, I think I saw this by myself even. <laughs> uh, it was a long time ago, though. It feels like it was longer than a decade ago. That feels ages ago. But it, yeah, it. I remember just being like, oh, they're completely just like taking all the comic book material and like throwing it out the window. And like that felt hurtful at the time. This time I'm like, since I knew that was coming, I was much more kinder on it. And like what, what hurts is like, there was moments that it would like pull me back in and I would kind of be under the spell of the movie for a few minutes. And then like, it would just make a really stupid choice and break that spell. And I hate that about this movie. It either needs to be completely bad or completely good. I hate this going back and forth thing. I love the like first 20 ish minutes. I love when he, when he, pulls into the town with the bodies. He has the conversation. He unveils the Gatling guns, which that was a huge trailer moment. They showed that in slow-mo like three times in the trailer, of like those Gatling guns coming out. And like, I love that scene, but like, it's all downhill from there. And like, I don't really know who this is for because like, you guys aren't like hardcore Jonah Hex people. You don't like it. I am. And I don't like it. So I don't really know who this is for. I don't think of boat fighting scenes when I think of a Western that just feels like a completely different movie to me entirely. And that it feels very steampunky once it gets to that point. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, it's, it's frustrating because it's a huge waste of resources and it's, there's so much potential and it should be good, but it's not. But now is the perfect time to reboot it. Reboot Jonah Hex now is an R rated (laughs) movie. That's what this is. 
That's why you picked it. This is starting a reboot campaign. It, reboot it now. It would be so successful now. I really believe it could be awesome now. You can even bring back Josh Brolin. Who gives a fuck? Like, but it like after Deadpool was so successful, we should be making R-rated comic book movies like crazy now, and we're not, and that's really frustrating. And well, the adults do birds want of to prey. see like this. Did anybody go see Birds of Prey? I did not. No. Oh no. But like. I'd, and like I guess I guess technically you could probably consider Joker to be an R-rated town movie, right? Yeah. yeah. Like I mean, we're we're having momentum, you know. It, it's it's a start, but like for how successful Deadpool was versus what people expected it to be, I would have like why is DC not taking more advantage of that? But whatever, DC hasn't made any progress in ten years, so this is the best version of Jonah X I'm gonna get, unfortunately, probably. But it that being said, I like I said, I don't know who this is for. It if you like Jonah Hex, it's just gonna be continual heartbreak. If you don't, it's just gonna be boring. So don't watch it. It's not worth watching. It it was interesting to check back in with it ten years later after seeing it in theaters and seeing how my perception changed, but it's it's not it's not for anyone really. Mm-hmm. It's a Western without atmosphere. Yeah. But yeah, you, it is. It's like you may chugging be, guitars and butt rock. Yeah. You may be pleased to know that according to Wikipedia, as of September 2019, uh, Warner Brothers is reporting development of a new Jonah Hex movie that will be a reboot and part of the DC Extended Universe. See, that last part there, just the, now there's no hope for it. You know, <laughs> if it was like Fox doing it, I'd be like, OK, there's a chance, you know, Universal, maybe there's a chance. They're gonna have. They're gonna figure out a way that he can like interact with Swamp Thing and John Constantine cool. in the Dark Universe. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Mm. Is that the final word on Jonah Hex? Yeah, I think so. Unanimous right. pass. It was wow. Four yeah. four passes. Well, there you go. <laughs> Boom. There it is. Uh, okay, so um, oh yeah, we forgot to mention this movie was produced by Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> in the credits. produced by Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> yeah, you know what? This movie's good for like bar trivia because everyone would lose. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you were like name three people in Jonah Hex, three actors, everyone would lose. Oh yeah, I didn't remember anybody was in this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Although, although this would be the movie you could use for the movie game, where you oh have my to God, yes. list an actor and then go to another movie. Like this movie mm-hmm. would have a bunch of people you could use. Yeah, oh, so yeah. it's like an ace in the hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> what's that? So keep that in your back pocket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for the next no time could, we go to no bars, could, uh, yeah, <laughs> nobody could like be like, hmm, because nobody's seen it, so nobody could like. Nobody could say, refute it. Right. Nobody could refute that. We should just play a round of the movie game after this podcast. Why not? We're never going to get to a bar again. So, um, yeah. all right. So next week, uh, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by Colin. Colin, what are we going to watch next week? Well, I'm going to continually try to impress you guys with uh, oh. Oh, 80s no. action movies. Oh, so no. we're going to try it, it again. Invasion USA? It is Invasion USA. <laughs> that's right. We're bringing <laughs> Chuck Norris back just in time for the canceled uh, 4th of July. I know we got time to go, but we may as well have it in there anyway, as he's going to save us single-handedly from terrorists. Boom. Invasion <laughs> USA. That's next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. So we hope you join us. Uh, give us your best Chuck Norris jokes. And uh, oh, no, we're going through all this again. <laughs> oh, no, it's a canon movie, oh, too. No. And it's a canon I'm, movie. Uh, I'm gonna go defense straight myself, Colin. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> uh, that may happen in the movie itself. Okay, so like until that. next week, then the basement is going dark. <laughs>